It's great to have you back on the morning show here on the Rise News. I am Adesua Omoruan. And I'm Rufai. It's really great to see you again, Adesua. Good morning. Well, research has it that the food sector SMEs are more focused on incremental innovation as opposed to radical innovation. And they are also more engaged in product and process innovations than in packaging, positioning, and paradigm innovations. Well, joining us now on the morning show to discuss innovations and sustainability of the African food sector, cutting across SMEs, startup business owners, MSMEs, is Joyce Akpata, Director General at the Nigerian American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, good morning, Joyce. Yeah, hey, good thanks morning. for coming on the morning show today. It's a pleasure. All right, good morning, and great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. All right, real quick, let's go to it. Let's talk about challenges bedeviling SMEs and MSMEs in the food space, because it's a very iconic space with a lot of potential mm -hmm. and possibility. But we don't move to the next level, and that's the challenge we have. I mean, if you compare to other climbs, and you have what, you know, people that started as MSMEs and small businesses in the food sector, like the likes of the Jamie Olivers of this yeah. world, mm -hmm. uh, Gordon Ramsay, mm -hmm. and they've been able to build franchises that have over five, 600 restaurants. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we don't, you know, sort of like cross over? Well, I think uh, for local MSMEs, the key challenge for them in terms of uh, growth and sustainability is uh, infrastructure. You know, they're, they're not able to scale up their businesses due to the challenges they face uh, uh, as a result of uh, inadequate uh, infrastructure. You know, for those within the food space, you know, and let's start with farming, for instance, you know, uh, a lot of the agriculture has been focused around more of subsistence farming. And I know there's been an increase in uh, encouraging uh, economic diversification. So you have a lot of people now being encouraged to go into agriculture. But then the infrastructure has uh, made it uh, a bit challenging and has resulted to a very large extent to a huge rate of uh, post-harvest losses, you know, because most of these uh, farms are located in the hinterlands and uh, they don't have uh, good access roads. So sometimes, you know, they are not uh, able to get their products to the market. So you have, uh, I think, about 40% of some of the uh, agricultural products being uh, uh, perishable and being lost as a result of those uh, uh, logistics uh, issues. So I think that uh, has impacted negatively. Uh, another key thing is uh, when you come to agriculture and in trying to scale up, is in the area of value addition. You know, if you're not able to add value to whatever you're producing, then you're not uh, able to take it to a higher uh, uh, level. Because you see a lot of people manufacturing, or sorry, a lot of people farming, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, are not able to now process it, you know, to get it a wider uh, commercial quantity. Yeah, a wider audience, and uh, you're not also able to to process it to be able to preserve it, you know, to make it available during off season. So there's the issue of storage. There's the mm -hmm. issue of storage. You know, you don't have adequate cold rooms. You know, you don't have the processing, and uh, capacity is critical. You know, to be able to scale up to, to that capacity, you need financing, mm. which is also a major issue, you know. Um, <clears throat> I know the federal government has done quite a bit in the area of uh, coming up with some financial interventions that uh, smallholder farmers or companies within the agricultural space can access, but uh, some of them are still unable to, to uh, meet the basic requirements to be able to access some of these funding opportunities. But really and truly, if they are able to access these opportunities, I think uh, there's much more they are able to do. Well, let's talk about the issue of quality and standards. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that is critical here. Because we've seen Nigerian produce, agri produce, being rejected by a lot of countries. Uh, just recently was the issue of yams going to the US. Yeah. Uh, how much of a premium do we place on that? Well, I think we take a lot of things for granted. We take a lot of things for granted. And uh, we're used to doing things in our own way. Mm -hmm and we feel every other person should accept it. But a lot of uh, SMEs that uh, we work with who uh, seek to export to the US, we always uh, encourage them. We, we actually inspect their products before we even try to push it out. There. Because key things are there's an expectation for, from the global market. You know, in terms of uh, uh, preservatives, in terms of uh, the whole process, you know, the expectations. And no one's going to lower their own standards to accommodate your own standard. It's for the Nigerian businesses that would want to export to increase and improve upon their own standards, you know, to make it more acceptable in the local market. I remember 
a couple of years we had issues with beans from Nigeria. The yeah, and that was banned, you know, because of the level of pesticides that uh, were used for preservation. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are critical things that uh, the global market doesn't toy with. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's important that we take those things seriously. And, and, and I want to just still, you know, go in that line of questioning that I did for a study. You talked about, because I was really excited you talked about bins, because that issue is still very prevalent mm -hmm. in society today. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about yam, I quipped a bit because why didn't we get it right with yam? If the charge for the export of yam was led by the Ministry of Agriculture in Nigeria, mm. and it was a bragging right, oh, yam was out of the country and things like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. but the minister was even part of this, and this was returned, why didn't we get it right? Also, a lot of you know people in this sector that export food items talk about how hard it is to get like an FDA certification, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. Why is it the case? And how can you talk to that small you know, business owner in the food processing sector in this country? Now, let's get an FDA certificate, the things they could do. Well, uh, on our part as a chamber, we did a lot of capacity building programs for some of these SMEs uh, in terms of how they uh, should uh, position themselves, take advantage of the global opportunities available. In terms of FDA registration, we have agents. You know, sometimes people don't uh, get their fingers burned because of lack of information. You know, you don't, you don't get the right information, so you don't plan properly. Or sometimes we are reactive. Mm -hmm. You know, you, get, you go before you come back to now start taking the path you should to. You know, so in terms of FDA registration, we have agents we work with who have uh, practice in Nigeria and in the can U.S. Can you mention some of them? You know, because people are listening, or how they can, the websites, where they can get some of them. I mean, if you, if you go to the FDA website, you have a list. Okay. It's pretty much straightforward. Okay. You know, there are certain things you can't do on your own, but then we would have agents that would refer you to and they could help you handhold you through the whole process. You know, so it's, it's straightforward. And uh, for a lot of the trainings we do as well, you know, we try to bring in experts and uh, bring in exporters that have been successful mm -hmm. to also share their stories, you know, to, to assist. Uh, a point in, in question, the yam you're talking about, you know, in exporting yam, you know, there is a particular... I'm not, I'm not an exporter, but, mm -hmm. you know, from my intro interaction, mm -hmm. You know, the container has to be uh, in a, within a particular temperature range. Mm. You know, and when that changes and all that, you know, the yams now start to spoil. Mm. So sometimes you might just have people creating their yams and just <laughs> shipping it off and not knowing that, you know, really there has to be certain things you have to guard against. You know, so those are some of the issues. Sometimes people just don't do the right thing because they don't know and because they don't seek out information. I want to talk about the Agawa program yeah. uh, that has now been extended to 2025. Mm -hmm. Are we maximizing this opportunity? I mean, it's about 6,500 items that could mm. be exported. Yeah. When you look at the figures on the continent, mm. I mean, Nigeria is doing so poorly in regards mm -hmm. to other African countries. Mm -hmm. What are they doing right that we're doing wrong? <laughs> what is the problem? I think uh, they've been very intentional about it. Mm. And uh, their governments have actively uh, been involved in promoting uh, AGOA or for them to take advantage of the opportunities. You know, a key thing, like I had said, infrastructure is a major issue. You know, basically what AGOA does is wa waiving off uh, uh, input duty, mm -hmm. you know, so you're able to uh, be competitive. For a lot of uh, African countries that uh, have taken uh, advantage of AGOA, you know, they have been able to establish like uh, industrial hubs. So uh, companies go there and process, you know, and manufacture whatever it is they're exporting. I mean, a key issue which uh, has been a drawback for us, of course, is power, infrastructure. Those are key things you have to consider. We are fortunate to have uh, labor in terms of our population. That's another advantage. But I mean, if you don't have these manufacturing hubs, you know, to be able to manufacture the volume required, because exporting to the U.S. is all about volume. You know, it's all about volume. Uh, if you're unable to, to meet up that uh, target quantity, really no U.S. Uh, wholesaler or retailer is going to, to mm. approach you. But I think we're making significant, well, little uh, progress because uh, uh, a few weeks back we had uh, the Agua visa stamp, which is related to textile, being approved. So uh, companies who are producing uh, textiles are now able to export to the U.S. under Agua. That uh, had been a, a, a bit of a challenge in a couple of years, but at least that's sorted. So we're taking little steps, and I think uh, we're consistent, and we might have more people. Still, still want to talk about the African Growth Opportunity Act at Goa. It looks as though 
from the quarter, what we just pack full in the quarter is crude oil. oil. It's oil. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's that's what we do with Agoa, mm -hmm. and that's not supposed to be the case because mm -hmm. it's got immense potential. Immense. It's got great opportunity, and I also want to juxtapose that with even some of our food exports. And why I'm very passionate about this is, I was hearing, uh, was it a Norwegian, you know, council in Nigeria saying the other day that from Oporoko fish, mm -hmm. you know, the stockfish, the yeah. dried stockfish, Norway makes nothing less than close to or over $40 million from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. How can we take all the small SMEs, form a cluster, put them through Agoa, and ratch up production and export of food items? Because we have a lot of this market out there in Nigeria, mm -hmm. and a lot of people need this market. Well, I mean, uh, like I mentioned, we've done a lot of capacity building programs. We've done access to market programs. We've taken a few SMEs to the U.S. to attend uh, trade shows, and you have a few of them already exporting on the Agoa, you know. But there's still more to be done. Uh, like I said, a key challenge is usually volume. And uh, we have the challenge of everybody wanting to do his own thing, you know. And <laughs> so that's also uh, that's a, a typical Nigerian mentality and all that, you know. I think probably trust issues. Mm. Because if you're able to come in as a, as, as, uh, as a cooperative or a larger group, you know, you're able to meet these uh, uh, demands. We also have a challenge of consistency. You know, we've had uh, situations whereby you have uh, uh, companies export the first shipment. When the uh, off-taker is requesting for a second shipment, they're not able to meet that uh, demand, which also comes into the issue of if they were able to come together as a cluster, they're able to move and able to achieve more. But we're encouraging uh, companies that uh, come to us, you know, to try to come in groups and uh, aggregate whatever products they have to see how they're able to now have more volume. You know, for those that produce, we try to encourage them that, look, you have to meet the basic standards, packaging, labeling, those are critical things. For your product to be on the shelf, it has to be properly labeled, you know, and all that, which are some things that uh, we take for granted here. So we encourage them and try to put them through how they should uh, uh, do that. We don't do that alone. We work with some of the government agencies or some of the uh, uh, local groups that are focused on uh, building capacity in those areas to see how we can strengthen these uh, uh, SMEs. I'm curious to know, I mean, apart from oil, what's the biggest or highest thing uh, food produce that we export to the U.S.? What, what would that be? We do... Uh, there's a lot of people doing cassava in terms of gari, processed gari. Okay. Then you have the regular uh, beans. You have uh, uh, you have beans. You have yams. You have oil, okay. palm oil. Okay. You know, so bulk of uh, the exports are around food uh, products. Then of course, you know, uh, cocoa, rubber, that are major uh, products that uh, we normally would export. Let's talk. Let's talk about the synergy with banks. Mm -hmm and how you've been able to help SMEs, you know, to get funded and things like that, because export, mm -hmm. it has some level of capital oh, inclusion to it. Mm. I've, I've heard a lot of small businesses talk about how hard it is to get a letter of credit and things like that. But there has to be a middle person, sort of like a go-between, and that's where the chamber comes in, and that's why the chamber should be able to speak for members. So what has been the relationship with banks? I mean. There are some banks there that don't even have an export desk. As we speak today, have you been able to bridge the gap? Well, uh, I think we, within our membership, we have uh, uh, most banks are members of the chamber. And uh, as a chamber, as a, uh, a bridge, we try to see how we can leverage on the uh, exposure and capacity of the larger members, like banks, for the benefit of the smaller members, like the SMEs that are coming up. So we regularly engage with these banks. And uh, of course, I'm not going to mention names, but there are key banks that have been export-focused and SME-friendly. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, we've done a lot of uh, uh, initiatives and programs in partnership with these banks for the benefit of some of these SMEs. We have, uh, over the years, come to realize that uh, you know, a lot of these SMEs are not able to access uh, financing or uh, opportunities because they are not properly structured. You know, no, no. Uh, the, the banks are not uh, just uh, charities. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have a proper business structure 
you know, to be able to ensure that uh, it gives the bank some comfort that mm. whatever monies they are putting in, you know, they would get back. Mm. You know, so we had to start from that level to educate these SMEs. Look, no bank is just going to, to give a Joyce and Company, <laughs> you know, uh, funding. Mm. You have to have your books, you know, in place, do proper accounting, because, you know, you have the issues of a lot of these SMEs running the businesses as themselves mm. and not separating their person from the, from business. the business. You know, a lot of them don't, don't have structures. Some of them uh, don't have, like, boards, advisory boards and all that, you know. A lot of businesses run away from these things and it, because they feel they are larger-than-life issues. But we make them understand that, look, to have a board, you know, in place is more of advisory. They're not, the expectations will be too high because they're SMEs. It's for you to get experts and people with uh, uh, varied uh, exposures, you know, to help you through your businesses, to have uh, a proper structures in place, have your accounting right. So when the bank comes to in inspect, they can see your history. You know, that would now guide them as to your needs and requirements and what you're able to accommodate to then help you. So you have, you've had, uh, we've had a number of them, you know, going back to, to tidy up their books and uh, putting the right uh, structures in place and have been able to access uh, financing. At a time when a lot of people question the foreign policy between the U.S. and Nigeria and other African countries, I mean, um, just last year, President Donald Trump described Nigeria as a valued and good friend when President Muhammad Buhari visited him. But I want to ask you, in your opinion, how would you describe the uh, bilateral economic relations between U.S. and Nigeria, uh, especially in terms of agriculture? Is it balanced? Is it balanced? Trade? No, oh, definitely it's not balanced. There's still, there's still a lot more. There's still a lot more we, we can do. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, agriculture, I think we've just uh, about uh, just scratched the surface. The opportunities are enormous, but the key thing, which has been a drawback, is for the U.S. in terms of uh, what we locally produce, they would rather have value-added uh, uh, commodities or products. Mm -hmm. You know, because what we've had in the past is or what's uh, obtainable now is for people uh, who produce these commodities to export them in their raw form. Mm. You know, but for, for the U.S. market, I think we'll be able to make more if we're able to process, you know, do some value, yeah, value addition, mm. you know, and all. Uh, I mean, I think a key example I would use would be uh, sesame seed and cashews. Okay. We do a lot of export of cashews to Vietnam. Vietnam and all that. And the Vietnamese will process and export to the U.S. They make all the money, mm. Mm. you know. So if we're able to have... Uh, uh, manufacturing plants that will process these cashews and rather than exporting them in, in their raw form, then, you know, that uh, will be more attractive for the U.S. market. Let's talk about export litigation. Mm -hmm. That's still a very almost non-existent sector in this country. We don't have export dispute resolution lawyers. Yeah. How do people, you know, resolve export disputes? There's somebody over there, there's somebody over here, there's an export dispute, the material doesn't get there on time the jurisdiction squabble. Have you been able to step in as a, as a chamber of commerce and industry between Nigeria and America? Well, we've, we've not had any of such issues. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, uh, there, we have the uh, ICC rules, you know, and uh, that typically would govern uh, international transactions depending on what uh, the agreement would have stated. Uh, of course, these days, most uh, agreements would uh, opt for arbitration as against litigation. No one wants to go through the, uh, the line of... Uh, 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 litigation and all that. So most agreements these days contain ab arbitration clauses. Okay. And basically, normally within your ag uh, arbitration clause, you would have uh, agreed on uh, uh, jurisdiction where the uh, whatever dispute would be resolved. So we try to guard, encourage them to in insert those clauses and guard against uh, such uh, issues if they arise in future. Mm. Okay. Yeah, mm. organizing the third, I believe, African Food and Products Exhibition. Tell us, what is that all about, and what do you hope to achieve from this? Well, uh, the African Food and Products Conference and Exhibition is uh, basically a platform which uh, we kick-started to see how we can promote uh, local businesses, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, it provides an opportunity for uh, companies who produce locally to showcase their products. So typically, we'd have a range of uh, exhibitors coming from the agro-business sectors, from apparel, from leather from other household items and all, you know, coming to showcase uh, their various uh, products. So we try to get uh, uh, off-takers, 
both from the U.S. and, and locally, mm -hmm. you know, supermarkets, chains and all that, you know, to come and uh, uh, view the exhibitions and pop, uh, see how we can broker deals. It also pr pr uh, provides a, a platform for both the exhibitors and uh, attendees to learn because we have a conference element that's all about uh, capacity building. You know, so we have uh, various uh, uh, eminent uh, panelists that will come and share uh, their own experiences and share knowledge on how best they can position their uh, businesses and also build uh, sustainable uh, businesses. It's also an opportunity for a lot of networking because we've uh, realized that for some of these businesses, it's actually they're actually looking for platforms that uh, can showcase them, you know, to see how they can... Uh, be in the consciousness of the consumers and all that and market their products. And for the third one, uh, how would you describe the success so far? I mean, the first and the second, uh, are there any improvements or you're just <coughs> doing this or just doing sake, let's just organize this conference, <laughs> let's empower people, let's be seen to be doing something. No, 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 what no. has been the, the impact so far? Well, I mean, uh, from maybe we share some of the flyers because we have, we've had various testimonials okay. from companies that have participated uh, in the last two uh, events, and we've grown. Okay. In the first year, I think we started about 90 exhibitors. Last year, we had a little uh, 100 exhibitors. This year, we'd have more. In terms of uh, attendees, last the first year we had I think about a thousand. Last year we had over a little below 2,000. You know, so it's. Uh, uh, increased uh, awareness, increased uh, uh, visibility for those that uh, participate. Also, in terms of uh, 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 deal-making, okay. for the first year, uh, we had quite a sizable, impressive number of uh, uh, companies that uh, got uh, off-takers for their products from uh, U.S. retailers. Mm. You know, so would it's keep... Growing. Yeah, we're growing. And, <laughs> and it keeps growing. And it keeps growing. I, I just want to know, what should be the expectation of people coming to this one, and how can they be part of it? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a veritable platform to, to come and interact, to come and network, and to come and learn about uh, products that are locally made and uh, uh, know these businesses. For exhibitors, it's a platform for them to put their products out there in the, in the, uh, in the market. And, uh, you know, that's uh, critical. So uh, in terms of participation, we have our website. is the AFPE at NigerianAmericanChamber.org. All uh, attendees need to do is to register uh, on the website and attend. It's going to be at the Lagos Continental Hotel, formerly Intercontinental on Kofa Biomi. So it's free to attend for attendees. The conference beat is also free. You know, once you're registered, you're able to also uh, attend. So it's Friday and Saturday. A key thing why we do the Saturday element is we've come to realize that. Uh, uh, with the increase in interest in entrepreneurship, you have uh, people who are working, mm. you know, but have uh, side businesses, they are growing. So the Saturday Beat also gives them an of opportunity course, to come yeah. and uh, 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 learn and be part of the program as well. I don't want to use the word side hustle, but I'd like to say <laughs> very thank you so much for coming here. It's a pleasure and thank you very much for having me. Thank you.